A little more than two years ago, I knew little to nothing about Jane Eyre. Back then, it was just another classic novel. I assumed it was a period drama and nothing more. At that time, before everything changed, there were two things that led me to where I am now. My love for romance and my interest in Timothy Dalton. After my most recent Timmy D movie binge, I came across several screenshots on Pinterest that revealed my favorite ex 007, gorgeously dressed in period garb, a small woman often by his side. This was Dalton's portrayal of Mr. Rochester in a BBC adaptation of Jane Eyre. Handsome guy, period romance, I thought. Let's do this. Going into this story blind was the best thing I could have done. I was expecting a slow burn romance, heavy with romantic tension and heated glances across the parlor. And let me tell you, Jane Eyre delivers on all accounts. What I wasn't expecting were ghosts, excessive gaslighting, cross-dressing, and possibly the greatest eye object moment in a wedding ever conceived. When your sexy love interest reveals that, surprise, he's been married this whole time. And, oh, double surprise, his wife is a madwoman whom he keeps locked in the attic of the house where you've been living and working. Let's just say I was knocked completely off my feet. Since then, I've rewatched the Timothy Dalton version multiple times, shared my bewilderment about the plot to many a friend and family member, and have gone on to watch three other versions of Jane Eyre. So, as the credits were rolling at the end of the 2011 movie adaptation, I thought to myself, you know what? I've come this far. Might as well watch them all. Thankfully, I'm not alone. One of my best and oldest friends has agreed to join me on my quest into deepest adaptation. Hers will be the voice of reason that attempts to guide me through the fog of this bizarre obsession. For every episode, we will watch a version of Jane Eyre and then meet to rate and review it. This podcast will chronicle our findings and document our insanity as we attempt to watch as many adaptations of this classic and buckwild story as we can. My apologies in advance for what you're about to hear. I'm Piper. And I'm Lillian. And this is the AirBuds Podcast. Lillian, hi. How's it going? Hi. Good. Oh my gosh. We're here. <laughs> we are. Thank you so much for doing this with me. This, uh, as you know, uh, I've been thinking about this for a while now, and uh, it's exciting that we're finally getting to dive into my obsession with this and your tolerance of this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm thrilled to be here and I'm so excited to move tolerance to, um, vaguely enjoy. Oh my gosh. And that is kind of one of my, uh, low key sort of goals is to get you to, by the end of this, once we've watched like 75 versions, uh, we're going to be at like a party some night and you'll say, you know what, Jane Eyre, not that bad, not my fave, but not that bad. And I'll drop my glass and I'll be like, oh my God, she said it. <laughs> she did it. And now I can die in peace. Exactly. <laughs> so we decided to start this with uh, the 1983 uh, BBC miniseries version, which is so kind of you to start on that one with me because I realized in retrospect, it had everything that I wanted in it and probably nothing that anyone else our age wants. <laughs> well, and by everything you wanted, you mean Timmy to eat. That's yeah. everything yes. you wanted. <laughs> Uh, exactly. He's, he's the majority uh, reason, but um, we, we started when we did like a test, we tried to do like the first three episodes and they were just so dang sad. And we got so caught up in the sadness and the suckiness of it that it was kind of hard, but um, yeah, we decided instead that we're going to tackle episodes one through seven, which gets us up to the big reveal. Uh, not quite, you know, it's, it's done to done. Something's happened. There's the object scene. And so uh, next episode, we're going to watch the fallout of uh, what is revealed here. So if you're cool with it, I'll just do a quick summary of the events, just so we have an idea of what we're talking about. Please do. I always love your summary. Oh my God. Okay. So here we go. I'm going to try to do this as um, articulately as I can. Okay, so we begin with uh, Jane's uh, tragic childhood. She uh, grew up in this place called Gateshead. She's living with her aunt and her horrible cousins. She was originally taken in by her nice uncle, but he died. So now she's left with these awful people 
Uh, her male cousin uh, physically abuses her, and when she fights back, she's locked in this room, uh, which is the room where her uncle died, and she thinks she sees a ghost, passes out, and this whole ordeal is enough that her aunt decides, the hell with you, you're too much for me, I'm going to send you away to this boarding school, um, which is like a school for orphaned girls, and she goes there, and it's just as bad, <laughs> except um, the people there she doesn't hate quite as much. Um, there's this guy, Mr. Brocklehurst, and he's a total douchebag. He literally humiliates her in front of the entire class and tells them all that she's a liar and they should avoid her. But luckily, she meets a nice teacher, and she also meets a, a nice friend. Uh, and uh, the friend's name is Helen. She dies off screen, which is bizarre because typically that's a pretty significant part of the story. And as we'll see in later versions, they focus on that. So it's so weird to me that this miniseries that took five ever to focus on people being cruel to her as a child took out that important scene. But anyway, uh, her teacher helps her out. She grows up, becomes a teacher at the school. When her teacher leaves to get hitched, she's like, well, my one friend is gone, so I'm not going to stick around this ass dump of a place. So she <laughs> decides to post a position uh, to get a job as a governess. And she gets this opportunity, says goodbye to everybody, and heads out. Uh, comes to this place, and it is called Thornfield. This is her new home uh, where she meets um, Mrs. Fairfax, uh, the lady who runs the house. Um, and she also meets Adele, her new pupil, who is a young French girl. Um, and when getting the tour of the place, uh, at several points, she hears this really spooky laughter. And she asks, asks Mrs. Fairfax, she's like, what the fuck was that? And she's like, oh, it's probably um, this maid. <laughs> she drinks a lot. Don't worry about it. And she's like, okay, whatever. Pretty creepy, but it's fine. Um, and so she spends some time with that girl. She uh, gets really happy in her place of work and uh, goes out for a walk one night, you know, high on confidence. Uh, spooks a man on a horse. He falls off. He yells at her. Uh, and she's all like, okay, fine, bye. <laughs> and later she gets back to the house and finds out, whoops, this was her employer. Uh, very handsome, uh, very, very tall, uh, Timothy Dalton, which by the way, horrible casting because Rochester is supposed to be ugly and he's not at all in this. <laughs> um, but so anyway, they have this whole like weird moment of you know, kind of flirting, like, he's definitely, like, trying to, like, suss her out, and she's just, like, holding her ground as best she can, uh, he, uh, decides he's into her, and, um, especially after she saves his life one night, when she, like, hears the laughter again, and then finds his bed burning, and puts the bed out by, like, throwing water on him, and he's instantly, from that point on, he's like, oh, man, I'm so in love with this tiny lady, I'm gonna do all this weird shit to make her love me, and uh, so then he starts um, cucking her <laughs> and gaslighting <laughs> her by like being like, ooh, here's this woman I'm in love with. Aren't you jealous, Jane? And she's like, I don't know, dude, you're my boss. I can't say anything. And he does, he plays all these weird mind games with her and uh, she deals with it and they have some flirty moments. And then she finds out that her aunt is dying and she decides to leave to go see her dying aunt. And I freaking lost it when I rewatched this scene because she goes to her aunt and her aunt's like I've wronged you twice once I didn't raise you like my daughter like I promised my husband I would on his deathbed and then second your uncle came to say that he's wealthy and he wants to take care of you and give you all of his money and I told him you were dead and Jane's like okay you suck but I forgive you and she goes to like hug her and the aunt's like get away don't touch me and it's like this lady needs to die <laughs> so Jane comes back uh obviously Rochester has been brooding the fact that she's gone and then he, you know, does more mind games until finally she breaks. Uh, and his the breaking point is that he's like, oh, well, I'm going to be married soon to this lady. Her name is uh, Mrs. Ingram, uh, Blanche Ingram. And he's like, when that happens, I'll send you away. And she's like, fuck you, dude. I like you. And you're being a huge dick. And he's like, oh, you said the words. You like me. And then they have this big confession of romance in the garden. They both say some beautiful things. She proves her her power, in my opinion. And uh, he like proposes and she's like, fuck off. And he's like, no, I mean it. She's like, really, really? And he's like, really, really? Scouts on her. And she's like, sweet, let's do this. Uh, and then there's a, a creepy moment um, where right before the wedding, uh, this woman comes in the night and rips her veil in half and like gets right up in her face with a candle and it's super duper spooky. And she's like, yo, this weird thing happened. And Rochester's like, you were dreaming. Ha <laughs> ha Let's get married right now. Don't ask any more questions. And when they are there at the uh, chapel, um, right before they can get married, a guy comes in, says, I object. He's already married and I can prove it. Oh, I also forget the reason he knows this is because uh, this guy came and he got attacked in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't know why. Right. It's a mystery. And, and you shouldn't ask any questions about it. Honestly, it's rude. 
Yes, because Rochester pulls Jane up in the middle of the night to look after this bleeding man, and he commands both of them. He's like, don't talk to one another. <laughs> Stay here and don't look behind that door where this creepy laughter is coming from. So, well, yeah. Piper's going to need a breath because that was a one breath marathon summary. It was a lot. Um, I think I got most of it. <laughs> yeah, so it sounds really interesting. The parts that I would say that you missed that are pretty important is there's a lot of slow walking. Mm, yeah. Um, there's a lot of, um, staring kind of just like at things, yep. not mm-hmm. beautiful scenery, just stuff. Um, <laughs> there's lots of bells, um, yeah. to yell at children because mm-hmm. the adults yelling at children wasn't enough. We need some bells to do it. Yep. Um, you forgot the dog. Oh my gosh. Yes. That's um, right. The most important character The I will just say this right now, mm-hmm. hard line, um, biggest flaw of this film, how little screen time pilot the dog gets. No, it's so true. We definitely need, I mean, this is our pilot episode, so we should definitely spend some good time making up for their mistake of not talking about pilot. Mm-hmm. And we will talk plenty about that big, beautiful dog. Yeah. So yeah. I do. I am curious. We got a little bit of your, your thoughts on yes, I definitely overall <laughs> sprinkled some of those in there, like some, <laughs> some of those opinions. It wasn't like a, a true, I mean, you were a journalism <laughs> major in college, so you should have been a little bit more unbiased, right, uh, but right. that's fine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, I'd love to know kind of, I know, I know, I know your opinions on this because we've <laughs> talked about it so much. It's the reason we're doing this podcast, but just like kind of starting from her childhood to, to like now, um, where we're at the wedding, what are your, your thoughts and feelings about it? <laughs> about Jane herself as a person? The whole show. The whole uh, show. <laughs> um, well, I would say, so of the like four versions that I've watched so far, this is definitely the slowest one that I've seen. So again, bless you for your patience of uh, enduring all of that. But in addition to that, I, I think Jane's performance is my favorite Jane I've seen. I, I don't know. She, the fact that she does, I think the casting really stands out to me. Like she does look weird. And I think that's very crucial to like Jane because she's tiny and it looks kind of like her face was like a little ball of dough that someone like poked two little eye holes in. Yeah, her Um, like beautiful, (laughs) to be clear, beautiful actress. Oh yeah. But yeah, she does have, especially that haircut doesn't do her any favors because it it makes her face look V tiny on her. Yeah. Like her face on her head looks very small. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also feel like a lot, like I was noticing watching it, like a lot of the shots are to make her look tiny. Like I think the director and really enjoyed the size difference because (laughs) there's lots of scenes where I'm just like, dang, she's like a thimble. Yes, dude. I mean, I'm right up there with that director. I like that too. Like literally when in the scene where she scares Rochester off of his horse and she goes to help him and he's like hunched over when he like kind of is like, get away from me. And then he like slowly stands to his full height. Her head like comes barely up to his chest. Like she is small and he is large and it's just like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. So I, I, I like her performance best of some of the ones that I've seen so far. And obviously I'm looking forward once we revisit those. Um, to really compare them. But I think her quietness and her, I think she conveys this kind of silent strength, I think, pretty well. And it's also really apparent just in her like intense stare. Like her eyes are very like, I'm not blinking. Like I'm just going to stare you down and deal with your shit, Rochester. So I like her. I adore him. I don't mind that he's uh, poorly cast and the fact that he's incredibly gorgeous, in my opinion. Um, From the other versions I've seen, a lot of them they went, the only way you're going to tolerate this man being this such an asshole yes, yes. is if he's super hot. <laughs> right. No, it's so true. But I personally love, I think Timothy Dalton, like he kind of pulls from his theater background in this performance and he really treats it like a stage performance, which I personally really love. There's a lot of kind of long monologues, which are a little boring to sit through sometimes because the camera direction doesn't really do anything. It just sits there and looks at them as if they were on a stage. But the, I feel like the performance comes through in his words, especially in scenes like the, the speech that he gives her when he's proposing in the garden. I, for me yeah. personally, I'm so swept away. I feel 
every emotion that he's conveying to her. These are some of my initial reactions. What are you, some of yours, Lillian? So one of the things that I find really interesting about this that actually makes me understand a lot of the choices more because the first, my first reaction to watching it was good God, why? (laughs) To so many of the choices that were made. But I think one of the things that made a lot of sense to me was it is the, it is a very pure adaption from book to film. Mm -hmm. So I, one of the things that I really enjoy about adaptions and one of the things that I'm excited about going through this process is the ability to take advantage of the different medium and to tell the same story, but using visuals more and using like a a different sense of things. But like one of the things that feels very bizarre in this, I've, I've mentioned And I wanted, I didn't have the patience to do this, but if I was a little bit more dedicated, I would have timed all of the like dead air walking scenes Oh God! (laughs) because so much of this series is, you can tell that in a book, it was like, and then she crossed the room to pick up the pencil. Mm -hmm. And in the show, we watch her cross a room and pick up a pencil. There's a full 30 seconds of small children walking in lines. Mm -hmm. Like it's, just a huge bummer. There's so much bell. There's so much bell. Um, so a lot of my criticisms stem from those first few episodes are hard to get through. Um, and honestly, if you're considering watching this, either watch it and roast it is like yes. one of the cool ways to watch it <laughs> or <laughs> skip the first three episodes. Yes. Um, <laughs> because you j- like, just uh, here's, here's all you need to know about that. It, her childhood, pretty much a bummer. Mm-hmm. It was a huge bummer. It was adults being abusive to her and yep. kids being abusive to her. Yep. Um, and then there was one nice teacher and that was it. <laughs> Even her nanny, who's supposed to be like her friend. What is her name? Bessie. Bessie. I want to say Bessie. <laughs> Bessie. Um, <laughs> not, not super nice. Um, and I think just some of my favorite quotes from that, um, that childhood time, uh, to give you kind of a little a little sampling um, is the teachers at her school said once when they were chatting, uh, we all know how evil potpourri is. Um, so <laughs> that's kind of the words. moral. <laughs> that's the moral guidance that she's getting. You mm-hmm. can explain the play on words if you want. I think it's just straight up and down literal. I think the audience is smart enough to get it. We can put out a poll on our future uh, social media to be like, are they talking about a commentary on the Catholic face or are they talking about scented and dried uh, berries and leaves that you keep in a bowl? Like they could be. They also said that a child was a liar, so you shouldn't associate with her. (laughs) They made her stand up on a bench and told all the other little girls to never speak to her because one time she probably lied. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one of the great compliments that Jane gets, um, this is, again, the other adults in her life are so mean to her that the bar is so low that this is the big compliment of her life, which is, I think you're capable of learning French. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) That's her very nice teacher friend says that to her when reading through- her stuff, which is important because it becomes an important skill in her life. Yeah. Um, that's how she gets her job. Yeah. And then again, the nice things that nice friends say to me, because this is something that like you could say to me when we are hanging out, if we hadn't seen each other for a while, like a classic way you would greet me. The first <laughs> thing you'd say to me after years, mm-hmm. which is what Bessie does yep. is say, I hope you're smart because you're short and ugly. <laughs> Is that, that's not actually like the word for word, is it? That is word for word what she said. Oh my God. Well, I think it's like almost kind of this joke that everyone is like, oh yeah, like look at Jane, so plain, plain Jane. And like, I love that, like, it's always something that she just like says about herself too. Um, Like later after like Rochester uh, has proposed and they're being like all cute for a moment before everything comes crashing down. He wants to like give her all these jewels and she's like, don't treat me like I'm a beauty because I'm not. Uh, She's like, I am your Quakerish wife. And I'm like, dude, hell yeah. Own it, girl. Yeah. I just think it's, it's, it's one of those things where do we really need to comment on it all the time? But that's what her (laughs) nice, good friends do. So that's, that's probably just a tough time is the first few episodes are just people being mean to Jane, Um, which does make more (laughs) sense why she then goes, this man who's been gaslighting me for so long is actually my truest love. 
Well, I, exactly. That's the weird, bizarre thing. And it's something that I'm really excited to kind of dive into over the span of these episodes and to kind of uh, analyze is this idea that we have to always like step back and remember this is a, a dark gothic novel, a uh, gothic romance. And like, it's not supposed to be like, oh, look at this perfect love. It's definitely supposed to be like, look at this woman who had a really hard life. And then just when she thought things were getting good, things went real bad, real fast. It's like, yes. oh shit. <laughs> yeah. I, I, re- I realized that that was one of the big tentative like my criticisms of it and the tentative liking and potential there I was doing too much of the criticisms of based (laughs) off of reality as opposed to gothic romance right (laughs) because I have a note down here and this goes back to the the fact that it's such a straight up and down adaption from the book is I think we lose a lot of the sympathy we would have for those characters Mm -hmm. Um, because I read a lot of romance books and one of the things I have written down here in all caps with three exclamation points from when I was watching it is she's 18. Yeah, She is 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And if in life that happened, it would be so deeply unacceptable to me. But then I did criticize myself immediately afterwards because I at the time was reading a book where the main character was 19 (laughs) and the love interest was immortal and he was more than 500 years old. Where do we draw the line? (laughs) It was bigger there. It was a bigger age gap. But because it was kind of that that made me realize, okay, this, so if this was a book, I would be able to see into the character's head and she's attracted to him Mm -hmm. and that doesn't make it in life. Okay. But if we can suspend that for a bit and Mm -hmm. be like, okay, yes, I'm seeing a very tall man who gets in her space a lot and is a lot older than her, (laughs) gaslight her, but she's falling in love. So I should get on board with that because (laughs) she's the main character and we have to root for it. Otherwise, this is just a nightmare story. Oh my gosh. Well, one thing I think is interesting is that that is a plot point that several characters point out as like potential red flags and warning signs. Like even the book is saying like, this isn't necessarily okay it's only really Jane and Rochester who are like we're cool with it everyone else can mind their own beeswax because like I think when she tells Mrs. Fairfax that she's engaged she says she's like he could be your father and she's like shut up don't don't remind me about that and um like definitely uh Rochester mentioned several times he's always bringing up her age but I think for him it's sort of like that kind of I don't know, male ego flex to be like, look at me. I'm with a younger woman. Ha ha. Still got it. Um, and, I, but- and I also think like right away, it's a little bit of that. Cause we see this a lot in him, like him trying to talk himself out of her. Like he talks about her, like she's this angelic, perfect idea of what life could and should be. And he's just too bad for her yes. um, and he's <laughs> he'll corrupt her and she, she shouldn't let him do that and she's like you won't corrupt me I'll save you and it'll be fine <laughs> which again in life totally works and is how yes. you should live your life obviously <laughs> so Lillian uh we've kind of covered our our impressions some of the things have stood out to us mm-hmm. we've definitely covered your dislikes what are some things that you did enjoy <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> challenge you is is there one okay. moment apart from seeing Ooh. pilot on screen for two seconds pilot the pilot is like the number one like he's yes. such a good dog yes. um the acting from pilot the casting of pilot perfection just 10 10 out of 10 10s yeah. across the board for pilot and everything that he's ever done I actually this go around really liked what is the housekeeper's name oh um mrs fairfax mrs fairfax i actually really liked her i thought she what she was a little too eager in the first couple episodes we introduced her i i felt i think because i was traumatized from watching jane be belittled over and over and over again that i felt her like <laughs> kindly teasing was mean like kicking somebody when they're down and I was worried Jane was just going right back into a crappy situation (laughs) but honestly it was her reaction to the proposal where she was like I actually have been kind of worried about the power dynamic here Mm -hmm. and I'm not sure you should do this and trying to kind of like gently ease Jane out of a clear mistake was I really liked that um I thought she was good I think the little French girl is a fantastic actress She's and I find her the perfect combination of like 
very endearing, but the kind of child that adults who don't like children is are annoyed by. Right. Um, so like when they have those big parties and stuff with all those other people, like I can see why the adults are annoyed by her, but she's actually just like a sweetie. Right. And it's the, because that act, that little girl actress, unlike child Jane, who I did not care for <laughs> <laughs> because that actress is so sort of like sweet and charming you you immediately believe them that the people who are not a fan of hers mm-hmm. don't aren't to be like you're not you're not supposed to like them right and the people who do like her you are supposed to like right I think that's a good opportunity to talk a little bit more about Adele and uh, kind of going into a bit more about the plot there around her and her relationship to Rochester, which we didn't really touch when I did my super speedy uh, <laughs> overview. It is uh, certainly implied, I think, that she is Rochester's daughter. I'm not sure if in the novel they ever actually confirm that, because the idea is is that he had this affair with a, I think she was an opera singer, singer, a French opera singer. And when he found out that she was seeing another man, he pulled all of his funding uh, from her and left her all alone. And then she came to him someday and was like, hey, this is like my child. Uh, also, I'm dying. And he was like, I'll take that baby, I guess. But he never like outwardly says, this is my daughter. I think he's in denial if she actually is. But nonetheless, he still brings her to his house and provides for her. She becomes his ward. And that what you said about the people who dislike Adele are clearly the people that we're supposed to not like because she's a sweet little girl who's totally innocent in this world. I think that kind of says something interesting about the way they handle Rochester's interactions with her because he kind of also is, he walks this line about whether or not he likes Adele or not. Um, I mean, he brings her gifts. He like has sort of an almost moment of tenderness when she's petting Pilot. And he's like, do you like Pilot? And she's like, yeah, he's nice. And he's like, okay. And it's clear that he really doesn't know how to interact with a kid. Just like every adult in this universe does not know yeah. how to interact with children. Uh, except for Jane, who spent her life being one and caring for others. Uh, <laughs> being one. Everyone else is just instantly born an adult. Um But then uh, he also has this disdain for her, which is just like his feelings towards her mother that he like, you know, projects angrily against her. And I think kind of what you, your analysis there, that's the same thing with Rochester as a whole, is that like, there are parts about him that are good, have good intentions, and he's like kind of wants to be good, but he also is like corrupted and has all this other bad stuff that he struggles with. Yeah, and I think that... My interpretation of her, uh, of whether or not he's her father, or at least my understanding from this is sort of that it's an open question, Mm -hmm. like that that's part of it is like, it's unclear if he, if she was also seeing someone else, like they don't have DNA tests back then (laughs) they couldn't tell. (laughs) So he just is the fact that he still like took her in. And I think it's such a clear contrast to Jane being war- Jane's wardship and how they treated her there. It's like, mm-hmm. I think when I was ranting a little too hard um, in a previous conversation with you about how <laughs> horribly they treat all of the children in this, you were like, they didn't understand kids back then. Kids were just to be like there to be yelled at. So um, I think yeah. in contrast to how Jane was treated as a child by every adult in her life and sort of even the people who we like hold to that higher standard, like Jane is supposed to be a whole new level of like, holy good. Like we're supposed to, people in her life are constantly accusing her of being bad. She doesn't fit the societal standards of being good, Mm -hmm. but she fits the moral standards of being good. And we see that in how she treats Adele. Right. I think that that's to your point, like that's the same thing with Rochester partly treats Adele the way that the rest of society would like, he might be doing what he's supposed to do to be a good caretaker by being really strict with her. So I think that that, that is a really great point and very, very interesting yeah. about the, the way she interacts with things. I agree. So Lillian, I feel like now is a good time. Maybe um, let's take it away from this talk of children and bring it back to the talk of romance. Um, yes. You have a section here that I'm very excited to uh, dive into with. <laughs> um, would you like to introduce this section? Yeah. So I think all of us are here to learn, right? Yes. Like we, we want to learn and grow. That's why you come to Jane Eyre. And particularly <laughs> as we've talked a bit about, it's what should you do in life with yeah. romance? And I think 
even though you're, you're engaged, you can always bring romance into your life. And I think our, our many, many listeners are always looking for opportunities to learn more about how to flirt. So based off of Rochester's behavior, I've written down some hot tips that I learned about how to flirt. And the first thing that I have here is um, when you meet someone new and you're trying to have uh, your first casual one-on-one conversation, maybe you met in a weird way, like (laughs) she knocked you off your horse by walking (laughs) in a street uh, at nighttime, you should set her, make her sit down by a fireplace closer to you than she felt comfortable. And then say to her, amuse me. So if you're ever trying to uh, just like have a conversation with somebody you have a, you have some feelings for. Um, and again, I think this would work with you and your fiance, just walk into a room, <laughs> sit down and look to them and go, amuse me. <laughs> well, with my fiance, he would have no problem with that. He'd be like, yes. sweet, you'll never get me to shut up. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is, this is practical, real advice. Yeah. Um, then, uh, as she attempts to do that, uh, ideally, and this is for you, cause you're going to tell them to amuse you, but you're not going to let them be in charge of the conversation. It's mm-hmm. still sort of like an interrogation situation. Mm-hmm. Um, if they come up with an opinion that you disagree with, Um, A great way to sort of like shut that argument down, like make sure that you come out on top, but still flirty and fun is to say, to describe the age difference between you as 20 years of age and a century of experience. That way you can like, sort of like in this fun, flirty way, belittle them. (laughs) So what I'm getting so far, Lillian, is uh, you find out that you have a crush with this person, right? Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. step one, invade personal space. Yes. Step two, assert dominance by controlling conversation. Yes. Step three, impress and intimidate with age and wisdom. Yes. Saying Got things it. like the 20 years more of experience. And then I'm old enough to be your father. Mm-hmm. Um, wink. And then <laughs> if that, now if you find... <laughs> The wink is super critical there. Um, It's supposed to be sexy. So keep it sexy. Yeah, Um, don't forget. (laughs) So then now if you're finding that by being really controlling of this conversation and turning it into sort of like a scary interrogation, maybe there's a power dynamic there like you're her boss. A great way to get her talking again, or whoever it is, we don't, we don't need to gender this person. Yeah. Um, if whoever it is, just say something, I don't know, like, I want to draw you out, speak. <laughs> That's like super flirty and fun. Again, mm-hmm. it's very similar to the amuse me in that you want to put them on the spot. Mm-hmm. You don't want to give them any sort of prompt. God forbid you ask a question. Just like say something at them and put them in a place where they have to come up with something to entertain you. So, you know, and then, I actually yeah. think looking back on my, on my years of, of being in the dating pool, I wouldn't mind uh, flexing these tips now and then, because my God, one of the things that always bothered me is if I'd sit down with a guy and he never had like a way to like contribute to the conversation. So I wouldn't mind doing a Rochester now and then and be like, you talk, I'm not going to help go <laughs> just be like, impress me. You've got five minutes. <laughs> Listen, I'm not saying I do that, but I am saying I'm single. <laughs> the other great one is like the whole time while you're doing this, you're trying to get them to talk about their history, their life. You need to do weird allusions to your dark history. Oh yes. Don't give any detail and, and not just like you do it in the first conversation, obviously, because you want to seem mysterious and interesting, but just sort of like sprinkle it in at times where it seems really normal. Like it seems like (laughs) things are normal and then just sort of allude to that. That's great. I think this is fantastic advice. (laughs) This is, this is a pretty critical turn that you're going to take here. Okay. Because at some point, you're going to start to have feelings for this person that you think is, is significantly morally better than you, um, Mm -hmm. as we've established with Rochester, it's important to have that argument out loud at them. So like your, your internal argument about whether or not this is okay, you need to yell at them. Like they're talking you out of having love. So the, the kind of two key ways to do that is to yell at them. I have a right to pleasure out of life. Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it did not make sure it's not, don't do it in a context where they're implying you don't do that. Do it when you're having, again, pretty casual conversation, (laughs) just yell at them. I have a right to pleasure out of life. 
And then as the conversation continues and that person doesn't disagree with you, say sweet, fresh pleasure. Ooh, but the way he says it, that's the key. <laughs> Listeners, when you're uh, doing your research to prepare for your next date, um, pull up this scene on YouTube and uh, look at the way he just talks about pleasure. It's all about the eye contact, the little curl of the lip. And it's like, damn, dude, what? Do your best to be Timothy Dalton when saying yeah. it. I yeah. think it's a pretty important part. Definitely. Um, and then I've got some quick kind of like high level tips for once you're through those initial conversations, Mm -hmm. you're definitely in love with them. Oh yeah. You you just need to like, kind of get them to really commit to you deeply imply that you're going to marry somebody else, Mm -hmm. dress up like a gypsy, um, and try to get them to talk about things that happened and admit their feelings for you. Female gypsy too. And like dress up as the old version of the opposite sex of what you are. (laughs) And lean into those stereotypes. Yeah. We don't want any level of um, cultural understanding. Nope. Um, really make sure that you're you're doubling down on negative stereotypes mm-hmm. about yep, that, a whole culture and race. That's sure um, in their heart. <laughs> that's how you win the best people, the oh, most yeah. angelic. And then when she gets mad at you, because she might. So if you're, de- if you're dating someone, they might get mad at you for dressing up like a gypsy. Mm-hmm. Um, just laugh, just laugh like in their face. Um, and then during that conversation is the best time to use your new cool nickname for her, which is pet lamb. So that's like, then shortly after that, she'll agree to marry you. Yeah. It's not going to be a problem. This is like a 12 basic step system Mm -hmm. that we've created for you here uh, that Rochester has created. And Lillian has so beautifully, uh, you know, written out for everyone to follow. Um, no, I think it's, it's foolproof. I mean, it works for Jane. So, uh, anyone could do this and and get what they want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it works for Rochester, which works for Jane. So (laughs) I want to go back to, so some of the things that you're talking about of all this, like insanity of this weird scene where Rochester and Jane are talking and it's where he's like saying like, okay, talk to me. And she's like, what do you want me to talk about? And he's like, I don't know. You come up with it. And she's like, I don't know. You're putting me on the spot. And that I feel like is an interesting scene to dissect because yeah, it's partially him having a conversation with her, but it's also partially him having a conversation with himself. And which is weird. I would, if I were her, I'd be like, does this guy have an inner monologue that only he like is that he's like obsessed with that he thinks everyone else can hear? I don't know. Like, cause he's, <laughs> But the other thing about that, besides the bizarreness, because that would definitely weird me out, but I guess it, it kind of has the, the element of mystery to it that maybe uh, draws her in. But the other thing I think about why it does kind of work for Jane, which I've heard um, like other kind of critiques sort of point out, is even though he is being like really weird by being like, sit down, talk to me, you come up with the topic, and it's like, whoa, okay, pressure. If you also then put it into the context, though, of like the world that Jane lives in and also being a woman, it is kind of interesting. And I think the appeal for her is that he like wants to hear what she has to say and that he like gives her the floor. I think it's interesting to, uh, we see something similar when he's first looking at her art and he's asking her like very personal questions and like giving her the opportunity to express herself to say like, were you happy when you drew these? And he, you know, wants to know her opinion on things. And so I think for Jane, that's kind of what does work for her in those moments. Yeah. I think that that does make a lot of sense. Again, like it's the contrast between how she's been treated in the past, which is horribly. Right. And then how this, this person is treating her. I do. I absolutely see the, he's having a conversation with himself. And I think that that's just sort of like the idea that like him letting her speak at all. And then him having this conversation with himself being the like romantic intro yes this relationship <laughs> like so many of the things that happen are him talking to himself partly because he's the only one with all the facts right, right. like she's he's most of the time gaslighting her <laughs> like yeah. sort of like and we as the audience who know the story cuz it's like it's even the people who didn't know the story know that it's a gothic romance and just mm-hmm. by the kind of conceits of the genre we can tell that they're that he loves her like that's what the story is yes <laughs> we know that when he's talking about like he sort of talks about this person that he's fallen in love with and he's going to marry and how he deserves to be happy and all this stuff 
she thinks he's talking about this woman that he's very clearly led to believe that he's going to marry her when actually he's talking about her. So there's lots of things that like we're sitting there. And I think particularly knowing you and how much you enjoy this kind of romance, you're like, oh, that's so sweet that he's saying all these nice things where I'm like throwing (laughs) grapes at the screen being like, just tell her it's so mean to do it this way. Oh my gosh. I know. It's like, he's very much, I think a child for how much he like points out that he's like, well, I'm your superior. And I have like all this like age and wisdom. I think he acts way more childish than she does because yeah, the fact that he plays these silly games with her and she's the straightforward and honest one. And also like, even when we see him like at the party, when he's doing that weird, like charade thing, (laughs) and he's like acting. And when he decides that he wants to like dress up as this like old woman fortune teller, it's like clearly Rochester. I think if he like wasn't born into the status and was thrust into the life that he was thrust into, I'm sure if he had a, like a choice, he would be like, I'm going to be, I'm going to become Timothy Dalton and go into the theater. (laughs) But he had to become the Lord of this land and oversee his, his renters and his tenants and have responsibilities and get stuck in a weird situation that he deals with very, very poorly. So true. Um, um, so yeah, everyone's everyone's doing the best with what they got. <laughs> importantly, I don't think we've talked about the most elaborate game of charades ever. Oh yes. Oh my god. They yeah. they have costumes. They do like a ten minute sketch for one clue, yes. and then they're so proud of that guy for getting it. I'm like, what? <laughs> I know. And like, I can't even think of what the actual like thing is, but it's not like where we play charades and it's just like, oh, uh, SpongeBob or um, I don't know, uh, football. It's like, oh, the wedding of justice and the battle of good and evil, of course. (laughs) Yes. But it's like they had costume changes for one clue in charades. Oh my God. I guess that's Um, what the old timey wealthy people did to pass their long empty days. That's pretty important. I also very kind of similarly to that, In general, one of my big uh, joys from this is uh, the great costumes. Uh, He has so many good vests. Oh my gosh. Um, And just generally, there's some really great ascots. um, Mm -hmm. But I just would recommend, so Richard, who's a character we sort of glossed over, the one who gets bitten by something, but isn't allowed to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Um, Before he's bitten, when he first comes into the room, he is wearing a truly terrific ascot. So it, it is an ascot bow tie. Um, do a quick goog of that if you would like to. It's a lot. It's a statement piece. Mm-hmm. I think if, if, we're, if I'm put in charge of men's fashion, which yeah. I think will happen any day now, they should wear more brightly colored vests, more ascots, and the bold ones should wear bow tie ascots. I agree. I, one of my biggest reasons for like being so in love with uh, period dramas is just the costumes. I many a time, even just like talking to myself while watching a movie, I'll see the men's fashion and I'm like, man, it would be great if that could come back and the person wearing it didn't look like a weirdo. (laughs) You can't just throw on your tails and a top hat and walk around without people being like, are you LARPing? Are you going to the Ren Fest? Are you in a production of Scrooge? Like, wh- what are you doing? <laughs> Listen, I, I think if you did do that, though, like if you are going to just like sort of boldly wear tails and top hat and an ascot and a bright vest um, mm-hmm. and ideally walk around with a cane, yeah. the key is going to be to yell amuse me at a lot of folks. Oh, yeah. um, that's going to be the way to interact in a way that feels super normal. 100%. Um, if your outfit doesn't draw attention, your voice will, and then they have to look at you. <laughs> All um, right. I think we should maybe start wrapping up with um, one of the few things that I do really want to talk about before we kind of move on towards our last little features is one thing I really love that kind of got me and I think would have gotten like the original readers of the novel is I like how this idea of kind of like ghosts uh, is introduced like very early on uh, and how then it continues through the story. So Jane, when she's thrown in the red room, she faints because she thinks she sees the ghost of her dead uncle. When she's at the house, she mentions to Mrs. Fairfax, she's like, are there ghosts here? And she's like, no. And then they hear the creepy laughter. And it's this kind of, I think, very clever way of because I did not instantly jump to what the actual answer was when I first saw this, because I, like I said, I went in blind. I didn't know the story. And so I love that it kind of like up until that moment, it's like, is this some weird supernatural thing or is it something much darker, AKA 
real life trauma. <laughs> um, my last thing before we uh, go into our, our ratings here at the end is just that there's two ways that I would love for people to sort of describe me when I'm not in the room. Oh. Um, one is by saying she's a singular person. Yeah. I think that's a cool way of saying Lillian's kind of strange um, I like it too. without being mean. Um, yeah. So please, whenever you're describing me to someone who's never met me before, just say she's a singular person and let them kind of put that together themselves. And then uh, we've talked a little bit about the fact that I'm single. And I think now <laughs> when I'm talking to, to people about it uh, in the future, I'm going to say I can live alone if honor requires it. Yeah, dude. Um, that's oh how I'm going to justify being single. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. Okay, that's, I think, a great way to kind of like bring in the ending of this discussion is just to kind of talk about the ways I think that Jane does a great job of kind of like showing her independence and her autonomy. I mean, like we said, within the context of this world, what she has is sad in comparison to what we expect nowadays. But I do love how many times she like proves that again and again, like, you know, she's like, I'm going to, I'm going to advertise for my work and I'm going to go find and do my own thing. She's like, I'm going to go out in the world and I'm going to take care of myself. And that's going to be totally fine. And I love how there's so many moments when Rochester is just being a total dick bag, just being like, Ooh, I'm goading you, Jane react, react, react. And she's just standing there. She's like, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to play these dumb games with you. I like you. You like me. I wish we could just talk about this normally. Um, and I love that about her. That's great. <laughs> Well, um, <laughs> sorry. I just, I think, I think it's such a, I, I need to, I'm working on it. I'm working on getting over my judgments about this, but I'm it's so just such a you. low bar. I know it is. It really is. Um, <laughs> we will surely in one of these many, many adaptations come across a Jane who is just so kick-ass. And it will yes. be insane. Because I think she's, that's the thing that I'm excited about. I think it's, it's one of the reasons why I actually like starting with this one that's more of a peer adaption of the book, mm -hmm. because I like the, the thing I'm excited about with this and seeing the different adaptions and all that stuff is I think that she's supposed to be this feisty, strong, like level-headed person surrounded by people who are batshit crazy. Yeah. And the batshit <laughs> crazy they nailed. But the the strong and level-headed I think contextually works. Mm -hmm. But not it's not enough for me. And totally. I think that I look forward to seeing different versions of Jane and potentially seeing some of that fire she's constantly being criticized for. Oh yeah, 100% I agree. Agreed. It's going to be a fun, a fun, fabulous time going forward. <laughs> so should we do our ratings right yes. now? Yes. Okay. Yes, we should. Lillian, would you like to start or should I take the lead <sighs> on this one? I'll start because um, this is, so this is the only adaption of Jane Eyre I have seen. And right. I've, I've seen the previous episodes, the ending episodes before, but it's been a while. And mm -hmm. I think we skipped a couple. Mm -hmm. um, so really I've only seen one through seven. Um, so I'm not comparing it to anything other than just Jane Eyre. Um, but I would rate this uh, five out of 10 pilots because there's just not enough pilot in it is yeah. like the main, like there's other criticisms that I've levied against it, but really the main thing is you should have had more of that dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's a very good assessment, Lillian. I agree. More, more pilot is always good. Mm -hmm. I think my rating, uh, cause you're right. We should start with a pretty like average to low bar because we can only go up or down hopefully <laughs> <laughs> we can only go up or down oh I'm sure there's way worse things dude there are like five silent films and we're gonna pick one of them to watch so <laughs> I'm gonna give this a and I might change later on as we have as we evolve but I think I'm gonna give this uh episodes one through seven a seven out of ten Timothy Dalton's mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. he like his his proposal speech wow there are so many moments when he's just talking and I'm like I don't even care what's happening you're here and that's awesome and but with how slow the opening is it really brings it down so it's only going to be a seven out of ten Timothy Dalton's for me yeah yeah well I think with that everybody must be dying to know what we think of the last few episodes and who knows what happens everyone does after this wedding where there's an objection we were left on such a cliffhanger oh my god where we don't know we definitely know what's yeah. gonna happen next 
oh, oh my gosh, who knows what's going to happen next? Anything could happen. Uh, he's actually a guinea pig in disguise as a man, and that's why he can't get married. Wow. He came so far, and he learned crazy. to speak. It was impressive. Uh, so yeah, if you've enjoyed this uh, this crazy uh, dissection, um, you definitely have to join us for our next episode where we're going to go through uh, episodes eight through 11, I believe, uh, to I finish. Forgot. I forgot there were so many episodes left. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, that's the thing is that like where this first group uh, started slow and then get really good, um, this second half, we we have a, like all the really good stuff in the first couple episodes. And then we have a long, like kind of slumps down again. So feel free to like read a book while you're watching those. Cause they're just like sad and slow. But God forbid you read Jane Eyre. Oh my gosh. I have no plans to read that book that I, if we would have to have a lot of listeners and they would have to sign a petition <laughs> to make me read that book. <laughs> That'll be our eventual goal to make Lillian moderately okay with Jane Eyre. And also to get the two of us to read this novel. Cause we have not read it. <laughs> don't want to I want to but I would still love it if people bribed me to do something that I want because <laughs> there's a little bit of Rochester in me <laughs> <laughs> there's so much Rochester in you that's what I'm always saying <laughs> well thank you so much for joining us for this first episode um we're very new here so I think by the end of the next episode we'll probably have some like social links and emails to share with you but right now this is our pilot our sweet dog running through a forest at night leading a man on horseback to certain doom and romance. So uh, forgive us for not having everything right off the bat, but we love you for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. We'll see you later. Bye. Bye.